good evening, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel of Prescott. It's time for us to sing, to praise, to worship together. Oh, that meant stand up. Stand, stand to your feet. Yeah, I know. I got to speak the motion. Hey, let's uh, pray and then we'll have this team of servants lead us, okay? Lord God, thank you for a beautiful Wednesday where we're joining together as the family of God. God, where we get to come to this church and Lord, right now, we want to praise and worship you. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray for just an anointing on this team of servants up here as they lead us. God, that all that we, how we sing, Lord, that we're just in tune with you, that we are um, there before your throne. We praise you today. We love you and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
can see Water's raging at my feet I can feel The breath of those surrounding me I can hear The sound of nations rising up We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome I can walk Down this dark and painful road Yes, he does. Amen. Uh, you can take your seats, or this is a good song to stand to if you want. Oh, 
Hey, church, let's continue, okay? It's time to worship through our giving of our offerings and our tithes to the Lord. I'm going to ask you please to bow your heads for a moment. Men, you may come forward now as we pray, Lord. Uh, we are so thankful that you are our Lord and Jesus, that you died on that cross that we didn't have to, that your blood was shed where we receive forgiveness, where we are washed and cleansed. Lord, this evening as we continue our praises with our voices now, we want to give sacrificially our offerings and our tithes to you, God, and we just pray, Lord, this will be our prayer always, that you would please guide us. Uh, show us where it is that you desire for us to use what you give, Lord, and we will do it faithfully for the glory, uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in his name now that we give and pray. Amen. Church, God bless you as you give this evening.
understand I'm in all of you Where your love ran red And my sins washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus Jesus so much awesome worship as usual hey you guys this is now our time okay to say hello to somebody nearby or introduce yourself uh, youth ministry you guys are excused at the cross at the cross I surrendered my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin Hey, you guys, welcome again. Oh, your singing was inspirational. I know that you just love the Lord when you're singing like that. It's just awesome to be able to do it with you. Good evening again, then Wednesday evening prophecy. My name is Raj Ahuja, and I am going to lead you in that, you guys. I am just, you can, I've been pretty fired up on these Wednesday nights. You know, well, I've been fired up lately, just Sunday mornings even, but uh, that's just a God thing for sure. This evening, it's going to be a little different, but I'll get there in just a sec. Uh, announcement that I want to make is next week, you guys, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday, uh, we have a concert here at the church. It's with uh, Justin Unger. Um, he was, he was uh, the former worship leader over at the Heights, and then he went, I think he went to Nashville, and he's been doing some recording and some other things. But anyway, he was supposed to be here with Jordan Felice. Remember, we had him come a couple of months ago, but he got sick. Like, literally that day, he got sick. So he decided, you know, he wants to, he wants to be able to do it. Obviously, this is kind of his hometown, so it's going to be packed out. Um, admission fee, is that up there? Yeah, it does. Look, free entry, uh -huh, but with a book donation, okay? Grades K through three. I didn't get any details. Uh, it's all I know as well. Um, so a book donation that's appropriate for kids in kindergarten through third grade. And Mia is going to be with him. You see a picture of her there. She actually led us in worship not too long ago. Just a real talented gal who loves Jesus. So that's going to be sweet to have her here also. Okay, so that's not this Friday, like I said, but in nine days, that Friday, 7 o'clock. Okay, well then let's uh, keep on going now, okay? Here's what we're going to be doing. This is our prophecy series. And I'm going to tell you something that motivated me to today's topic. So, oh, this weekend, lots of you asked, how did this weekend go? That's right, I wasn't here this weekend. Well, I was here this weekend, but I wasn't here on Sunday. The wedding was just phenomenal. A lot of you, I see, you were there. How incredible it was to have uh, the dads up here, Pastor Tim and myself. We got to, we got to marry our children together, and it was, it was God-glorifying. Uh, Definitely, you could see how Jesus is going to do an amazing work in their, in their little lives. Um, they're in Hawaii right now having a good old time. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll get them when they come back, trust me. Um, but they're having a, a great time. So, Sunday then, Pastor Steve took the pulpit, and I know he did a great job as well in delivering the word. Um, that Sunday... So that Sunday, one of the reasons why, first of all, you get exhausted planning a wedding, right? Uh, secondly, we had lots of family in town that I hadn't seen in years. 
And so we wanted to spend a little time with them, you know, seeing them off. Well, one of my relatives, and I have told you about him before, we've had some really spirited conversation about my faith, about my religion, about me being a Christian because none of them are Christians. And by the way, that was cool. I'll tell you more about this on Sunday. Very cool. So many of them had no idea that this is what a, a Christian wedding service could look like. Like they basically expected me to be in robe, like chanting something in Latin or something. And here we are having a great time, you know, we're laughing together, we're saying Jesus gets all the glory together. It was so cool. But so anyway, this particular one, so we talked. And what I remember now, this was in Pasadena, okay, this was a long time ago, it wasn't this Sunday. But when I had a conversation with him over in Pasadena when we lived there, here was the deal. So I was on fire for the word of God. I was on fire for things like prophecy and whatnot. And I started telling him about fulfilled prophecy in the Bible. Uh, just started naming things that were happening. You know, I said, you know, Israel became a nation. And then they took Jerusalem in 60, 68, 60-something, 60 60-something 60 or other. <laughs> um, and it was, it was uh, uh, prophesied in Ezekiel, or in, um, in the scriptures. And I started talking about some other things like that. And I remember this skepticism already, this look on his face. I'm like, dude, like, come on, man. This should excite you like it excites me. And so what he did, sort of just like, ah, cut my limbs off right there at the knee, you know? Um, he basically said, you're talking to me about a book that's basically a fairy tale. He goes, you're giving me all of this, but it's from this book. And he proceeded to talk about how you couldn't trust it. It was written way back when there were all these errors. It's been proven over and over again to be, you know, a fraud. And so he basically, even though he didn't do this in front of me, this is what he was doing. He was sticking his fingers in his ears. He didn't want to hear what I had to say. I mean, the prophetic evidence, you guys know we've been doing the prophecy. How strong, how powerful that is. But he, he just wrote me off wholesale because he said the scriptures were not to be trusted. That you know what, you guys? That's totally true. Uh, this is what often people will think. So I've been teaching you about prophecy. I've been telling you about fulfilled prophecy. I've said, you know, get ready. The scene, it's opening up for us. I think last week we talked something like that, right? About what's to come. Here it comes. This is what the um, Antichrist is going to look like. And this is the, the things that are going to unfold. What about a person who says to you from the get-go, I don't even believe your Bible. So I don't even, you can tell me whatever your Bible says in Ezekiel and Revelation and blah, 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 blah. But this is what they're going to do to you. And they're going to stick their fingers in their ears. Guys, what about that foundation? What about knowing the, God, the word of God is authentic? What about knowing that it is something we can stand on and say, listen, you may think that, but let me tell you really what this is about. And so with all of that as my background in praying about it, here's what I think we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the authenticity of the Word of God. We're going to talk about why you can trust in the Word of God. Because you guys, if you can't do that, what's prophecy? If you can't do that, then what good is doing a prophecy series? How about people who ask you, you know, what does Peter say? Peter says you're supposed to be able to give an answer. And dearly beloved, are you ready to give an answer? Can you give an answer? Tell me why is it that your word is the right word? Tell me why you would say it's genuine. Why is it that I should trust in this few thousand year old manuscript that you call, you know, the book of Job? Or this, this other manuscript here that supposedly your newest, but it was written something like 1900 years ago? These are the things that people are asking us. This is what's getting written off in schools, in colleges. 
they write off our foundation, then they don't even want to hear about your prophecy. So, so this is the motivation, okay? This is the inspiration for this evening. Prophecy for sure, but let's make sure we're right there and we got the foundation below us. One quick verse that I want to, re- well, two verses, but one section that I want to read to you, and that's this. You realize Paul, who wrote 13 of our letters, right? 13, uh, three fifth, or two fifths, close to half of the New Testament. You know what the last words before he died were that he wrote? Right there at the, at the end, right there in the last section of what he wrote was this to his young son in the faith, Timothy, his disciple. He said, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, what? All scripture is God-inspired or God-breathed. All scripture is useful. Now that word useful, by the way, means it meets every need. All scripture meets every need in teaching, in rebuking, in correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. Notice that Paul leaves nothing out in this next little phrase. For every good work. You want to do a work in Christ, you know what your foundation is. It's the word. You want to be able to talk about prophecy. You want to talk about the miracles. You want to talk about whatever, you guys. It's the word. If the Holy Spirit put on the man who wrote most of the New Testament, I want the last words you write, make sure you know my word, then let's do it. Tell you what, let's pray. And then we'll look at some of the things about this word and why we can stand on it as the true word of God, okay? Lord, we are thankful for this Wednesday evening again. So thankful for being able to sing with our hearts to you, our praises, to worship you, Lord, um, right there, your throne. And now, Lord, it is our prayer, please, that you would uh, do a special, special work in all of our hearts as we feed on the word of God, as we are nourished by your word. Lord, as we grow in the things of God, please, Lord, make those things happen, we pray. Lord, multiply our understanding. We pray, Holy Spirit, that as you fill us afresh, you would give us great, great wisdom. And Lord, empower us to go and to live these words for your glory. Uh, Lord, we're looking forward to seeing what you're doing tonight in us. We praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the word. This is the word, this is the manuscripts here. You will often find the phrase, thus saith the Lord. This is God who says, my Bible is my word, or my word is my word. That which we call the Bible is authentic. It's something that we're supposed to stand upon. I want to give you evidences for that. Why can we say amen to the phrase God speaks, thus saith the Lord? Okay, now... I've got nine. Now, I don't know that I'm going to make it through all of these, okay? We're going to try, but, but I, I, will. I, I know I go over every always. I know I go over just a little bit. I'll try not to, but let's go for it, okay? So here, thus saith the Lord. Why can I say amen, God? Firstly, this, because I'm challenged to think. And, and, I, and it sounds perhaps a little simplistic, but it's actually not. There's something rich and deep in God telling me that if you want to accept my word, I challenge you to think about it. You guys, um, if I were, if this were a mosque and I was an imam, if this were a Hindu temple and I were the priest, you know what? I couldn't be having this study with you right now. I could not be saying to you, let's talk about why we know that our scriptures are God inspired and totally true. I couldn't do it. This is the only religion, this is the only sacred text where a man can stand before a crowd and say, I can prove to you that these truly are inspired by God himself. This is what you get to do. You get to think and believe. Uh, One day Jesus was having a conversation with a man who was an expert in the law. That's how the Bible described him, an expert in the law. 
And he asked him what the greatest commandment of all was. Remember, that's in Matthew chapter 22. What is the greatest commandment of all? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Um, when I first became a Christian, I can't even tell you what a, a, a sigh of relief, but more a sigh of comfort. To be able to go to that church over there, and I remember hearing the pastor stress. Hey, maybe in the Old Testament, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Because that's what it says in the Old Testament. And because I want you to remember something. Jesus added or stressed the idea of heart, soul, strength, and he said, mind as well. And I was like, you're right. He did say that. And here he tells a guy who's an expert in the law, you want to know the greatest commandment? Bam! This is what we're called to do, beloved in Christ. We're to know the scripture. We're to know the truth of our faith. And part of it is to engage the intellect. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, test everything, hold fast to what is true. Uh, John said in 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. I, by the way, I have experience with people who tell me they have experience with spirits. Well, here's my answer. Just because it's a spiritual engagement doesn't make it right or true. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Uh, yeah, it's a spiritual battle, right? Uh, yeah, these false prophets, the Bible says, the false prophets are going to come and they are going to lay it on heavy. These lies and these false beliefs and all this other junk. Jesus had an interaction, the Bible tells us, with a scholar and this scholar basically talks to him. They're engaging. And here's what we're told. We're told Jesus' perspective. Look, this is Mark chapter 12, verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he, this is the scholar, answered wisely, also translated as intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus, Jesus acknowledges a thinking man. He says, because you engaged your mind, boy, you know, you're right on the edge. Now, oh, yes, Jesus didn't say, okay, man, you're saved, you're good to go. But he did acknowledge how important that was. You want to know why this is a thus saith the Lord manuscript or text? Because God says, go ahead and challenge. He says, go ahead. I, I equipped you with a brain. <laughs> Use it. And you'll see. Do you remember back in the 80s, there was that crazy wacko priest guy. His name was uh, Shri Rajneesh. He was in Oregon, and he had all the Rolls Royces. I think he had like 90 or 100 Rolls Royces, and they were in Oregon, you know, if you went into his ashram, you would see this right above the door as you are walking in. It would say, check your shoes and your brains at the door. Yeah, it's true. You are to empty yourself. And by the way, I've had a lot of uh, experience with people who tell me that. You're too empty. Can you believe it? You imagine walking into a place and it says, ah, oh, check your shoes. Okay, I get the shoes thing. That's what I grew up with as well. But brains, hold it. But that's what he says. How opposite that is, huh, to what you and I have. I remember again, let me, another kind of personal story. You remember the book, The Case for Christ from Lee Strobel? You ever read that book maybe? He's got also the case for a creator, the case for grace, the case for faith. He's got all these really cool books. But his testimony, 
So he's a journalist. He's a law. I don't know if he has a law degree, but he studied law at Yale. And he called himself an avowed atheist. That's what I called myself, avowed atheist. And he says that his wife, who was an agnostic, comes to him one day and says, sweetheart, I've decided to follow Jesus. And, uh, you know, he goes, Girl, like, what are you, insane or something? Have you lost it? And she pursues it. So he decided that he was going to engage his journalistic and legal skills and go after the Bible. Really, what he said was, Christianity but any religion. And... 21 months of investigation. 21 months. I didn't even know it was that long. I didn't know he went for 21 months. But he went for 21 months, investigated everything. And here's a quote. He said, based on the torrent of evidence flowing in the truth of Christianity, it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. He said he couldn't do, he couldn't become an, I mean, he couldn't remain an atheist because he was trained in journalism and law to respond to the truth. Like how powerful a statement is that? Because of my background, I had to become a Christian. You understand? That's engaging the mind, you guys. That's what we're called to do right there. This was back in the early 80s that, that Strobel has his testimony there. Um, he, he's got it online, by the way, a YouTube video. You should watch it. It's really, it's really inspiring. So that's number one. How do we know? Thus saith the Lord, this text really is God's. Because we get to think it, we get to challenge it, and we will find it to be so. Number two. Let me go to number two now. Hey, I call this one extraordinary unity. Okay? The first one was what? Think and believe. This one I'm calling extraordinary unity. So here's, here's the thing. You think about that, boy, this, you just step back and you go, this is a total God thing. Uh, you got one story. You, you've got a thread that goes from Genesis to Revelation, don't you? I mean, you read from here to here, and there's that story that you can't miss. And it's flowing all the way through. Nevertheless, you guys, I say things like, turn to 2 Corinthians, turn to Ecclesiastes, turn to, I'm naming one of 66 books that comprise that one Bible written by at least 40 authors. 1,600-year um, time span, 15, 1,600 year time span, yeah. Africa, Asia, Europe, yeah, written on three different continents. Um, what else? Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three different languages. Writers, let's see, there were a couple of guys, they were fishermen. Um, Old Testament, there was a sheep herder. There was a military general, there was a king. There was um, a rabbi. There was a cupbearer. There was a physician. There's every kind of background you could possibly think of. And they're writing about all kinds of topics. What about styles, you guys? What about when we say parables? Right? What, what, about, what about when we say psalms? What about when we say proverbs? What about just history? What about letters? Whenever I say those words, I am describing to you a style of writing. Let's go to the proverbs and look at it. So there's all these kinds of different styles as well. And so the question is, I got different guys, different years, different languages, different styles, d d different continents. If I took those, eh, just step back. If I took all of these different writings and I went like this, uh, uh, I put them all together into one, would I just kind of expect some thread to flow through them, so to speak? No way. Of course I wouldn't. I would expect it to kind of like be the, what do they call it, the square peg in the round hole or round peg in the, who actually knows whether it's the square peg round hole or round peg square hole? Don't raise your hand, I don't want to know really. <laughs> but one of those things, that's what you expect with all of this. Do you know what? You don't. And I think it's really interesting that Jesus himself said you can't. He says in John, or in John 10 verse 34, 
he says the scripture cannot be broken. He's talking about a unity, a conformity. There is something that holds it all together. And he says, it would be impossible for you to be able to go like this. I can see how this shouldn't be there. Jesus said that my, my, my ministry stands on the unity of the scripture. That's miraculous. When you say the very man who's the center of the religion understands how different all the writing, all the background, all the styles are, and yet he challenges you to say, I can't even stand here if any of these break apart. That's a powerful testimony. And that's what he does. You guys, that's why when we read Revelation, we say, let's turn to Daniel for more information. You know, we turn to, we, we, we go to Matthew and we say, let's go to Isaiah to understand some of the background of this Messiah. You're, we sort of presume upon that. But if you think about what we're saying, we're saying, let's understand a 1,900-year-old letter by referring to a 2,600-year-old letter. And when you put it in those terms, it makes you go, wow. And this is one of the things then that Jesus says you must do. Oh, they won't break. In fact, know that they all come together as one. That's a God thing right there. Okay, let's go on. Number three, okay? So number two was the unity. Extraordinary unity. Amazing unity. What's number three here? I have perfect transmission. Okay, perfect transmission, right? Not the thing that costs a lot of money to replace. Not that transmission. Copied generation to generation to generation perfectly. So the story goes, you've probably heard a little bit of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the story goes that prior to their discovery in the 40s, um, the oldest manuscript that we had of Old Testament writings was a thousand years after Jesus. So up until the 40s, the oldest manuscript for Old Testament stuff we had was a thousand A.D., so this kid's playing there, you know, near the, near the Dead Sea, got the caves there, and so the story goes, like a rock or a ball or something goes into one of the caves, and he hears like a hollow, like a thud, and captures his attention, he goes in and he investigates, and he finds all of these clay pots. Doesn't know what they are, so people come and investigate, lo and behold, through five caves in that area, they find these scrolls of scripture, these scriptural texts, these scrolls, which we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Just like that, overnight, we now had perfect copies of Isaiah, the Psalms, Leviticus, much of other Old Testament books except for the book of Esther. And those were dated to around Jesus time. So a thousand years had just been subtracted that quickly. So they compare what they had thousand AD to zero. I'll just use that, okay? To zero. And you know what? They go, holy smokes. There's like no difference here. And they're checking all this stuff out. And they're amazed to find that these are what they called exact or precise copies discrepancies, discrepancies, because I used to be one of those atheists who would say there were all sorts of discrepancies. You know, if you really analyze the so-called discrepancies, seriously, you guys, here's, here's the extent of it. Putting a V or a thy or a thine kind of a thing. And that was it. it, it that, that was the major so-called discrepancy of the text. And then, obviously, as time has gone on, we have discovered much more. That was the Old Testament. You got the New Testament. You got what, like 5,000 plus Greek manuscripts. You got Latin Vulg uh, Vulgate, uh, like 10,000, you know, manuscripts. You just don't have any other book that's close. Um, Plato, right? Plato writes thousands of years ago. You know, <laughs> you know the, the span between him writing 
and a copy of his text is 1,300 years? We have 10 copies. And that's the closest we have to when he wrote those things. And what about Shakespeare? You know, Shakespeare writes, what, 30-something plays, 32, 34 plays or something. We don't have a single original copy, not one. He wrote those in the 17th century, right? Not a single original manuscript. Um, the ones that we have, so goes the scholarship, have substantial blanks. Substan for, you know, for all I know, Romeo could have told Juliet, let's go get some cheesecake. But, uh, but somehow some writers decided that's not what Romeo said. But it could have been. It could have been. That's just the way it is, though. But think about it, you guys. So we have, we have no originals from 17th century Shakespeare. And that's true of basically all books you can think of. And now we got all these, these texts that are, man, they're on it. And they're just perfectly copied one over the other, over the other, over the other. I wish I could tell you about the procedure of copying. I can't. But whoa. Whoa. Like, man sakes, are they careful to get those copies accurate one over the other over the other. It's, it's pretty intriguing. You might want to just kind of check it out and see how they did it. Okay, so, so the copies. So getting the transmission perfect, we know scientifically we have discovered that they are those. Now that leads me right into the next one, which is what I call historical accuracy Sort of what I call technically the accuracy of accuracy. You know, does that make sense? Maybe technically it should have been the precision of accuracy, but the accuracy of accuracy. In other words, okay, so you got a bunch of texts and they are perfectly copied one over the other, over the other, over thousands of years. Does that make them true? No. You could perfectly copy lies. You could perfectly copy fiction. There's got to be more to it than just saying, you know, 1,000-year script, 2,000-year script, they line up good. You got to say, wait a minute now. Where's history fit into all of this? Many, 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 many references in the Bible. Just think about this. To people, to places, to events, to things. So many I was listening to one guy uh, talk about it. I don't know where he even got this number, so this isn't official, okay? He says, he says there are, there are 19,000 references. I don't know if that's true. I can tell you that there are a whole bunch of references in the Bible of people, places, events, things, and so on and so on and so on. But they can all be substantiated. That's where you go, wow. At right, the book of Acts, 300 plus. Just the book of Acts alone, 300 plus people, places, events, and some things. Uh, the story goes, there was a, a geographer slash historian. Uh, his, he, what was his name, Ramsey? Oh, William Ramsey. So he wants to write a book of first century, you know, that area of Europe, first century Europe, um, where the New Testament was sort of uh, being written from. And he was taught in university, uh, Oxford, there was no authenticity to the New Testament script. Like, for example, the book of Acts specifically, don't trust it. Don't go there. It's nothing. It's just fiction. So his story goes, this is a bi by the way, this is an autobiography you can check out as well because he became a Christian. I just gave the end away. So he becomes a Christian, but he's this academic now, told not to look at the book of Acts. He goes to that area, like checks it all out, you know, he's making his notes, but realizes that he has no accurate reference to history back then. Like, like he's heard stories, but he's like, I want to at least find some historian who writes about something. Frustrated, he says, the best I could do was like, couple hundred years after the events. He says, that's the earliest stuff I could find. Five years where he persisted in just doing personal investigation and using 
academic writing. He said, I was done, close to the edge, on the verge of quitting. And he just decided to pick up the book of Acts and start flipping through it. Lo and behold, everything right before him unfolds. All, all these things, these references to locations, these references to, street, to streets, these references to people. He realizes that these people in the book of Acts just had different names, but they were those people. And so he's looking at how incredibly accurate it was, and he says, I couldn't help but come to the conclusion that the man who wrote Acts was there. This wasn't something that came hundreds of years later. This author, he was in the streets, and he was watching. He goes on to look, and eventually he becomes a Christian. You know what he spends the rest of his life doing? Defending the Christian faith. He becomes an apologist and defends the Christian faith. Um, yeah, yeah, they're accurate. The accuracy is accurate. Uh, interesting little factoid. Genesis, where did I hear? Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10 has more uh, uh, external references, meaning to people, places, stuff, than the entire Koran, just, the, just chapter 10 of the book of Genesis. That gives you some perspective on the Bible and what we purport to know. Hey, we're putting it out on the line. If the book of Acts has 300 things, you know what we're saying as Christians? You have 300 opportunities to prove me false. But you can't do it. And, and, and so it just leads more and more to the Bible being the, the word of God. Here, another factoid that I found. Secular discoveries. In other words, people finding, let's say, a coin in some cave somewhere or reading some manuscript of history somewhere. Over 100,000 of those refer to something that the Bible already made reference to. That's pretty impressive. So it goes both ways. What the Bible refers to, you can find evidence for. What out there refers to, you can find evidence for in the Bible. So, you know, goes this argument, you guys. If the writers of our Bibles were so accurate, and, you know, they cared so much about this detail of coins being right and monuments saying the right thing and people with the same amount of crowns and blah, 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 blah. If they were so, so careful to record that, why do people doubt when they record the things that Jesus did? Why do they doubt the things that men and women experienced by the power of their God? The logic goes they would be more careful to record that stuff than this stuff. And this is something that I tell people when they debate, when we discuss the, histor the historicity of the Bible. All right, let's go on. So that was the accuracy of the accuracy, right? So we know that it was copied perfectly, and we know that what was copied was spot on. Number five. Um, scientific uh, respectability. Okay, I got, that. I got that term. By the way, you guys, some of my sources for this evening's study, you know who's, who I didn't even know was a really good um, apologist was um, Greg Laurie. I didn't know that. I thought he was a big evangelist, but he's a big apologist as well. So I watched a couple of his sermons. There's a pastor, Don Stewart, who's a big Calvary guy. He's an apologist. Plus then I went and read some, some of my my textbooks that I just read. Anyway, so he came up with this term, so I'm using it, scientific respectability. Um, point that's very important, okay? The Bible is not a scientific book. The Bible is not an unscientific book. The Bible is a non-scientific book. 
Very important to, dis to uh, make that distinction. It is not a book of science, and it's not a book of anti-science. It's just a book of non-science. It, it, it's not something that God focuses on as he writes this. What you see is the writing of people inspired by God, and what they write is what they see, what, what God leads them to see. It's all from their perspective. It's all what, uh, well, really, I'll just keep it at that. It's from their perspective. And people criticize you or they criticize me because they say God wrote this book and yet he inspired his authors to say the sun went down? Like what? Did they think that actually the earth just sat there and the sun went like this? And this is where you have to just be able to say, look, this was, it's, it's a non-scientific book. It's, uh, our weathermen say the sun when the sun goes down. We just use that terminology. But when the Bible refers to something, say, scientific, it's spot on. Second century B.C. How about this as an example? I'm going to give you an example. Um, uh, Hipparchus is the, is the astronomer of the day, second, second century. So he looks into the night sky, and he is able to tell the world we have a magnificent number of stars over us. And he literally counts 1,022 stars. And everybody's like, oh, wow. Something like 400 years later, uh, uh, Ptolemy. So he looks up and he goes, oh, my buddy from 400 years ago, he was wrong. Oh, we had a lot of stars. But let me tell you, here's how many stars we have. 1,056 stars. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we get up into, into um, uh, Johannes Kepler, you know Kepler? So, so he's in the uh, 17th century. Now, some people say, I gotta investigate this one, that Kepler actually himself counted some thousand something of stars uh, right there. And, and this was up to the 17th century where people said, we have so many stars, we have a thousand and something. Well, then Galileo comes. He's the one who, you know, just, uh, invented the telescope. He looks up into this night sky and his jaws drop because he realizes, I can't even fathom what I'm looking at. I can't even fathom all of these little dots that are above me that are out there around me. And so he didn't. He didn't make any effort to count how many of these stars there were. Modern day science tells you something like there are 10 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And it tells you on average, every galaxy has 100 billion stars. And so if you were to do the multiplication, you know, that's 10 to the 24th power, it's, it's 100 billion trillion. That's a pretty big number. Well, when you read the Bible that referred to the stars, written way back when, when they would have said there was a thousand in the sky, it's pretty interesting what the scripture says. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22. It says, as the stars of the sky cannot be counted. It makes reference right there that there are more stars than you can even fathom. And yet all you could do if you were just a guy looking up saying, I want to know, is you'd come up with a thousand and something. That's pretty sweet. But this is what the Bible does when it comes to hygiene. You, you ever you heard the story about, um, oh, this was in Vienna. It was in the 17th century. And it was a hospital where I got to think about this one because it's just on the tip, it's on the tip of my brain. Um, so there's a hospital where they're delivering babies and the story goes like this. They are realizing that moms are dying. Like a whole bunch of moms keep dying after they're delivering, after they're giving birth. And one of the administrators at the hospital wants to know why is it that 
the moms at this hospital are dying. And what he realizes is that every doctor or every nurse who's now going into the delivery room started his or her shift, <laughs> you know what? Doing autopsies, playing with dead bodies, doing that stuff. And then you know what they did? They would just come with those hands that are all dirty, uh, you know, that have all that bacteria, and they would go and they would deliver little baby. And mom would get sick and mom would die. And so he instituted this policy that said, hey, if you're going to go from this station to that station, you're going to need to wash. And he forced them to use some kind of, I don't know what kind of sanitizer they had back then, but he forced them to use it. Lo and behold, mom stopped dying. And it's really interesting that in the Old Testament, Back in the day of Moses even, it says that if you ever handle a dead body, do you remember what it says? It says if you ever handle a dead body, you have to wash your hands in water, running water, in running water, that you have to make yourself clean before you can come back and be a part of, be a part of everything else. Well, that was thousands of years ago. And that was Moses being told by God, if you're going to handle dead bodies, you need to get washed. You need to be washed. This is the kind of stuff that you find again and again and again and again. Um, so yeah, you guys, it's not, a, it's not a book of science, but if there's ever a disparity, the disparity is not the scripture. Uh, the disparity is the so-called science. Uh, that's the reasoning for the disparity. And you find that it sort of centers itself back on scripture when there's an objective study done. This is, this is just one of those real, real amazing evidences to put. To me, it meant a lot back in my day. And I just want to encourage you to know some of these kinds of details. Human anatomy, by the way, astronomy, geography, all kinds of scientific endeavors where the Bible's got it spot on. Number six, we got to get mo keep moving. I, told, I said nine, right? I'm not doing too bad. All right, so number six. All right, this happens to be what we're here for, our Wednesday night ser uh, series, but prophecy, about prophecy. Now notice, I intentionally put it at number six. It's part of it, you guys, but it's not the primary thing. Prophecy. Oh, when you see that something written way back when is precisely uh, fulfilled, you say, wow. And you ask questions like, how is it that that happened? So absolutely, absolutely prophecy is so, so key. I was able to share, not in this meeting, but in a meeting several years ago, uh, some things that made him think. And it was about just Jesus. That's all I talked about. I didn't talk about revelation. I didn't talk about anything like that. I told him about Jesus and his first coming and about the prophecy. And I, and I told him, I want you to know something. Jesus was written about hundreds and thousands of years before he was even born. And I just kind of started naming some things here. Look, I said... Um, it says uh, he would be, uh, oh, his lineage. I said it would say, or it said that he was of the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of David, that he was born of a virgin, that he'd be called Emmanuel, that he was born in Bethlehem, that great persons would come to him while he was young, that children would be killed at his time because of him, that he would be called out of Egypt, that he would be preceded by a forerunner, John the Baptist. He would be anointed by the Spirit. He would be a prophet like Moses. He would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He would begin his public ministry in Galilee. He would enter publicly into Jerusalem. He would come into the temple. He would be marked by poverty and meekness and compassion. He would preach in parables. He would m work miracles. He would be rejected by his brethren. He would be a stone of stumbling for the Jews. He would be hated by Jews. He would be rejected by the Jewish leaders. The Jews and the Gentiles would combine against him. He would be betrayed by a friend. His disciples would desert him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. The price would be given to to buy a potter's field. There would be 
all sorts of suffering for him on his way to the cross. He would bear the sufferings of others. He would be patient and silent during his suffering. He would be struck and spit on. His hands would be nailed to a cross. He would be forsaken by his Father in heaven. He would be mocked. He would be given gall and vinegar. Soldiers would gamble for his clothes. He would be numbered among the sinners. He would intercede for his murderers. Not a bone in his body would be broken. He would be pierced. He would be buried with the rich. <sighs> I think I just read you 30 of at least 100. Just, it went on and on and on. And I could tell there was interest. You guys, I want you to know this kind of stuff. You got to be able to tell people these things. Where did I get this information? You know, you go to the book of Isaiah. That's a, an awesome place for it. But there's so many other places too. Maybe you've heard the, the visual illustration. This is sort of a pastor favorite, but I've never used it before. But so goes the, so what are the probability or what are the chances that this could happen? And it was all Jesus and Jesus alone. And this guy, I think he was an apologist. I'll find out. But he's the one who said, if you take the entire state of Texas, and he said, if you take silver dollars, I think he did this back in the 50s when they actually had silver dollars, is if you take silver dollars and you line the entire state of Texas two feet high with silver dollars and you marked one of them and then you allowed somebody to come into the state blindfolded and they went and they actually picked it out. He said, that's the chance, the same number, same probability as Jesus fulfilling all of these prophecies. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? That's amazing. But these are the sorts of things that the Bible teaches us. So I want to challenge you guys. Make sure you know some of these things because people want to know. All right, so, so there's that, the prophecy, okay? And the amazing statistics and all that other stuff that's involved with it. Plus, we're in a prophecy series, so I've taught you guys a lot of prophecy, so you got a lot to refer to. All right, number seven. Um, I wrote, the Bible isn't Facebook. Not this one. The Bible isn't Facebook. My principle is, it's honest. Huh, because you already know then where I'm going with this, why that's... A, when people put their, you know, their bios and they put their stuff on Facebook, not too many of us talk about the lie we told to or the attitude we had with. No, we, you know, we got the nice happy pictures. We talk about the great things we think of and the people we had fun with. Ah, the Bible doesn't do that. It doesn't, it's just authentic. That was another word I used here, authentic. I also use the word honest. Honest, authentic. You know what God does? He uses people. God just uses people. And I tell you what, you guys, when you deal, maybe some of you have this experience, when you deal with people in other religions, particularly where it matters so much that you gotta be good to sort of evolve into a God, because that was my background, you find people who are shocked that I could actually say, did you know that God, God sort of saved humanity through Noah, you know, who built this ark, lots of faith over a hundred and something years, but, but then he gets drunk and he falls asleep naked and his son, you know, comes and sees and causes this big, this big sin, this big rift. And they're like, wait a minute, because Noah, we know that name. Shouldn't Noah be some mighty, holy man? And I said, well, actually, he was a man of God. He believed, he had faith, and he acted, but he was still a man. And when I tell him these sorts of things, you guys, what about Father Abraham? Huh, what did Father Abraham do? He lies about his own wife. What is, what is Moses he leads them to the promise to the promised land, but he doesn't get to go in to the promised land. Jesus tells his disciples that he'll soon be betrayed and killed. And what do those guys do? They start arguing about who's going to be the greatest. 
they're just selfish dudes. And yet these are the ones that are going to be chosen to begin the, you know, the gospel message being shared with humanity. Yes. When you see the authenticity that the Bible is no Facebook, um, it plants a seed in some of these people, folks. And I'll tell you what else it should do, and I hope it does for you. I hope it encourages you. You know, sometimes people will come to me and say, you know, Raj, I can't serve because I just. And yeah, that's some foolish sin. And, and we have to repent of these things and turn towards the Lord. You know, I decided that I... And I'll say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, you know, you're a man, you're a woman of God. You need, to, you need to turn towards righteousness. But then I'm able to encourage by saying, listen, God's going to honor your turning to righteousness. Um, an encouragement. He uses guys and gals like us. Okay? So you stay faithful. And if you do fall into some foolishness like we all do, you be authentic before the Lord. You be genuine before the Lord. You fall on your knees before the Lord. The Bible tells us to repent of our sins, to seek forgiveness, and he will forgive us and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. I think that's an apology, that's a point to, to make when you talk about your faith and your Bible being authentic, unlike any other religion. Let's go on. Number eight. The Bible's uh, uniqueness, okay, or unique teachings, unique teachings. Now, this one, it's so rich, you could spend many, many studies talking about this, but you're talking about uh, what Bible teaches about the true God of heaven. I mean, how unique is he compared to the gods? So unique. Uh, what about the Savior, the Messiah of this faith? So unique. What about the relationship that people have with the God of heaven through Jesus? So cool. So unique. You men, hey, I get to call you brothers. Those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we are brothers. I and mean, we don't even look like it, but we really are. We're brothers. And we're going to spend eternity together worshiping the same dad. Abba, right? Father of heaven. And ladies, you as well. That's so unique. All I can tell you guys is this. Know, um, um, appreciate, uh, share the uniqueness of your faith. It's a very powerful apologetic tool. Okay? By the way, apologetic means defense, defensive. Apologia means defense in the Greek apologetic tool when you explain to them that he's your father when you explain to them that he lives within and the bible actually says you're the temple of the holy spirit that's just mind-boggling that people can know that they can have such an intimate and personal relationship with their creator this is most unique you guys and these are the kinds of things that you want to share and show, hey, if God is my temple, I'm sorry, if I'm, if I'm God's temple, uh, boy, Raj better really, really, really just fight for that sancti sanctification. You know, if something does make me dirty, so to speak, spiritually, if I'm falling into some kind of sin, you know what's got to convict me is my unique relationship with my God. This guy is actually called the temple of God. What a humbling realization, huh? Christian, what a humbling thing. When we sit on the uniqueness, just that thought alone, that was my first response, humility. I couldn't even believe it. But anyway, you guys, this is what we do. Uh, just as a verse reference, although I didn't tell these guys for the screen, but Psalm 19.7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, making wise the simple. You know that relationship says God cares about you so much, he spends time making you better. That's a unique, that's a unique concept. It is, it, uh, and then it says of the word, it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit. God gives us something that works, not something you have to hope for, 
not something that you have to do the right ritual to get. He says, if you take my word, I promise you, it will change you. Oh, that's unique. Who gets something like that? So these are the sorts of things that we want to make sure we tell those folks, okay? These are the sorts of things that allow us to say prophecy is something we can study on Wednesday nights because this is what it comes from, this Bible. Okay, moving on now. Let's go on. I'm so close to being done, you guys. Here it comes. How about this one? The Bible's indestructibility. The Bi I, I borrowed this from another guy as well. That was, that was number two that I took from another guy. The Bible's indestructibility. So here's the deal. It's, it's to say, so here's how I sort of penned it out. It stood the, it's withstood the test of time. The Bible has withstood the test of time. Um, kings have banned it. Emperors have forbidden it. Critics have criticized it. Philosophers have denounced it. Atheists have assaulted it. Infidels have mocked it. And yet it stands through and through every generation after every generation after every generation. I remember a guy giving a metaphor, giving an analogy, um, how the Scots build their fences three feet high and four feet wide. That's how, that's how um, the scriptures are because if somebody knocks it over, it's actually taller than when it was before standing up. In other words, it's always there and it's always serving its purpose. That's a, that's a great thought. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands for a couple of years. Hmm. For this generation. Um, since Jesus. Nope. Forever. That's power. Regardless of the immensity of the attack against God's word, it has always withstood it. No matter how much Satan has wanted to make, it, make you or me deviate from it, the Holy Spirit has always brought us back. No matter what it is that people try to do to corrupt it, no matter how it is that they criticize it. Huh? Yeah, what about Voltaire? If you know anything about that French philosopher, back in his day it was said that he said that within 100 years of his death, the Bible would become a book of antiquity. In other words, it would be a, a book that people wouldn't even want to see anymore. In fact, he said, basically, only um, collectors would ever want a Bible again. You know, he, that's the only people who go for it. And so the story goes, Voltaire dies within 50 years. What was it? The Geneva Bible Society ends up buying his house and putting a printing press in it. And they print and stack Bibles in Voltaire's house. The guy who said, within 100 years, the Bible will be gone. That's not the case. You guys, would you please share? Share that truth. I know too many people who switch from religious text to religious text because somehow, someway, it's been made irrelevant or it's been proven false. Take your Bibles and let them know, man, you can stand on this. This thing is indisputable. This thing is indestructible. Why? Because that's the God who created it. Um, folks, that's, that's, I cannot, you, yeah, you're going to have to like high five me or something because I'm actually done. So I had, you understand now, listen, in my personal notes, in my personal writings, I had more like 15 or 20 different line items, but I can't give them to you. So I'm just giving you really the, the sort of 30,000 foot view of, of all of this. Um, I want to encourage you guys to be able to, not to be able to, to study this and to do it in an academic format. If you're the type who really loves your devos, and you better be the type who loves your devos, and you follow after, you know, I don't know, Oswald Chambers or somebody like that, awesome. But you need to engage your mind. You need to be able to share with people why when God says, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Make sure, husbands and wives, you are encouraging each other to know these sorts of things because they matter. Don't be satisfied to say, well, at least I got my proverb of the day. Be, be insistent. You know, fight the, fight the good fight against yourself because sometimes we can get lazy or we can say, you know what, Raj will teach me when I get there Sunday. 
It's not my job. You know that. I'm supposed to definitely teach you, but I am not your primary teacher. Okay? You, Holy Spirit, make sure that you are learning. Make sure that you are growing. I'm going to have a quote come up on the screen, and this is what we're going to close with. I, I could not find the source of this quote. All I know is that Gideon Bibles have this on the inside cover, but even they don't tell you what the source of this quote is, but it was so good, this is what we're going to close with. Okay, listen, I'm going to read it, and you can follow along. It says, The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, too, heaven is open and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of a paradise of glory and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be open at the judgment and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. That's powerful, isn't it? Well, with that said, would you close your eyes? Let me lead us in a prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And when we read those words, thus saith the Lord God, we know it to be true. Thank you that we have this, um, this sword. Thank you, Lord, that with it we're able to learn and grow and to teach and to re rebuke. God, we pray, please, that you would continue to enrich us with its truths. And Lord, please, as we, as we know it, as we grow in it, Lord, please give us opportunity to use it. Father, we pray, please, that you would put into our paths those who ask or who seek, those who wonder, even those who challenge. And Holy Spirit, we will just rely on you to speak through us these truths. And Lord, we desire that others will come to this truth they will see the light. Lord, um, we pray that you would do a special ministry in all of our hearts as we ourselves are being transformed by this word. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, those who might be struggling in some sin, Lord, those who might be comfortable not really knowing your word. God, for all of us, we just pray, please break us of that. Lord, that indifference. We pray, Lord, you would kind of light that fire under all of us. We know the time is short. We know, Jesus, you're coming back now. Lord, so we um, look forward to seeing what you have for us and how you will use us to accomplish your great things. We pray that by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys, why don't you stand up now? It's time to close in a song of worship. If you need any kind of prayer, please make sure to find a leader. Come to me. I'll be happy to pray with you. Pray with each other always. So you know the studying of the Bible better be obvious. Make sure uh, this coming Sunday, okay, we're coming back together. We're going to be studying in 2 Corinthians. Boy, that's going to be so sweet. And um, say your prayers reading those things that are getting your minds growing in the Lord. And you know what? God will use you to do really great things. God bless you. Have a great night. What to say, Lord, is you gave me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now that you have saved me. Lord, I 
give all I am to you every day I can feel the light that shines your name every day Lord I'll learn to stand upon your word and I pray that I that I may come to know you more you would guide me in every single step I take
everlasting God, we've come to honor you tonight and lift up your name.